what started out as a childhood fascination with ghosts and goblins became a journey that led Ginger Howell into the occult. I was always attracted to scary stories, to like ghost stories. When I read ghost stories, um, it excited me and it thrilled me and it kind of made me scared all at the same time. Even though Ginger's family attended church, her mother had no objections to her daughter's interest in the occult. She even bought Ginger an unlikely Christmas present. I was 13 years old. My mom had bought me a satanic Bible just because I had picked it up in a store and had been flipping through it and she noted my interest in it and she went back and bought it. Ginger's life took a drastic turn when her parents divorced. My mom remarried a man who was very abusive and uh, physically abusive and he was an alcoholic and so my home life went to one of relative peace to one of just complete chaos. So in search of stability, Ginger studied spell books and as a young teen became convinced that turning to witchcraft would give her the security she desired. I did a lot of spells of protection because my home life was say, so chaotic and I had abuse issues with my stepdad that a lot of the spells I did were for protection um, and I felt that they had worked because out of all the children I got beaten the, the less. Doing rituals and spells gave me a sense of power. Reading tarot cards I thought was a way to see into the future and what was going to happen so I wouldn't be surprised by things that would come my way. By the time Ginger was in college, she considered herself a Wiccan and joined a coven of witches. We thought that we were just pagans, that we were worshipping nature as witches. We didn't feel like we were evil or wrong. And in fact, most witches don't believe in Satan. They believe that there's a goddess, and it's almost like goddess worship. The coven seemed to provide the close bond Ginger lacked with her own family. It gave me a sense of belonging and uh, people that were also like-minded and it gave me a sense of, I think, security because I felt like I could deal with my problems that way, that any problem that we were having, um, we could deal with it by making a ritual. Ginger and the other members of her coven cast spells. Some, they claimed, healed people. Other spells were for protection, but every once in a while, even the witches were frightened. We actually saw beings manifest in the room that we were in, and they were very tall, uh, probably six and a half, seven foot tall, and they were dressed in robes, and they stood behind those points on the circle that we had drawn. And we didn't talk about it during the ritual, but then after it was done, we said, did you guys see that? And we all had seen the same beings. These supernatural manifestations scared Ginger, to a point. Once I was doing a spell and I was in a room and it was rather dark and I had candles lit for the ritual, of course, and a shadowy figure came to the window of my room on the outside of the house and my dog started howling, not barking, but howling. And at that moment I turned around and I saw the shadowy figure almost trying to get in um, and I blew out the candles and ran from the room. All the time that I was reading tarot cards or doing things um, that would frighten me, I would almost be repulsed by it and I would put it down for a while, but then something would draw me back to it, always. But not all of Ginger's friends were witches. One was a Christian. She was very insistent that I needed to go to church with her. And so I began to go to church with her just to make her quit asking me. Ginger enjoyed the church services and went again. But she didn't see a conflict between Christianity and witchcraft. Until she started dating Jack, a backslidden Christian who knew nothing about Ginger's other religion. I had just gotten a new deck of tarot cards and I was really excited about them because the, the pictures on them were really neat and a very expensive deck and so I had showed, I had called Jack in and showed him the tarot card deck and I put him on the table and he acted like I had thrown a snake down and he said get those away from me and that was the first time that anybody had ever reacted negatively to stuff that I had been involved in. As Ginger found love and acceptance from church members, she realized she needed to make some major changes if she was going to follow what the Bible said about avoiding evil influences. 
I started breaking off from the coven right away. They would call me, they would threaten me, they really were angry that I had left their path and started going down this other path and finally I had to change my phone number and just sever all ties and I moved to a different house and they couldn't track me after that. Ginger and Jack married and enjoyed being a part of the church family. But Ginger still didn't understand what a relationship with God was all about. When I was pregnant with my first child, I began to wonder uh, what to teach him because at that time I had grown, I was no longer in the coven, I had not been doing witchcraft or any occult things, and I was wondering what would I teach my child. Ginger found the answer to her question late one night. She was watching television while nursing her son. I landed on the 700 Club program because a Satanist was giving his testimony and he was talking about how he was a Satanic high priest and how he wanted to come and talk to a pastor about having a relationship with Christ. I thought if the Lord could accept him being a Satanist, then he can accept me for all that I had done and forgive me. And so that's when I said the sinner's prayer at 2 o'clock in the morning watching TV. I became a Christian. Ginger put her tarot cards, incense, robes and spell books in the trash. So the next day when I took the bag out to the curb and the garbage man took it away, I felt like a whole burden had been lifted from me. I felt much lighter after all that stuff was gone. Ginger steadily grew in her faith. Before I became a Christian, I had a lot of doubt. I had a lot of anxiety. I never had peace in my home life or as a child or when I was involved in the occult. But since becoming a Christian, I have moments of just pure peace that you just can't put any price on. Jesus is Lord of my life, and He is alive. He is real. I can't keep it a secret any longer. I've got magical powers. Watch. Many teens are intrigued by witchcraft, and Hollywood feeds that appetite with shows about young people involved in the occult. Sarah Sampolik turned to witchcraft to give her power over her life and the identity she was looking for. It began that search of something that I had just been interested in, the, the whole occult thing and, you know, seances and the Ouija board growing up and all those things that I maybe just dabbled with began to turn very serious at a time in my life when I desperately needed more than what I had. I considered myself a witch in high school. Though I was a solitary practitioner, I really felt like um, that this was really what I was supposed to do. You actually are inviting spirits, um, inviting those things into your life. And, um, and I did that on multiple occasions. And I believed in this idea of a spirit guide. What were the manifestations? It was more outward signs, um, you know, things falling off of a shelf by themselves or hearing a ball roll across the floor. As she was drawn deeper into the occult, Sarah says that she was desperate for her life to change. Her spirit guide led her to believe that there was only one way she could really experience change. I really felt like I was getting signs that, that really, for my life to change, I had to die. And, and in a physical sense, that, that I, had to, I had to sacrifice my life and, and, and give that as a sacrifice. It was that idea that if you, if you let go of this, if you, if you sacrifice this, then, then you'll get a new start. You'll get a new chance. So Sarah took her car, which leaked carbon monoxide into the passenger compartment, and drove off with the windows rolled up. Her hope was that she would crash and kill herself, making her suicide look like an accident. I remember waking up thinking, uh, you know, knowing what I was was supposed to do um, and I looked over my car my car door sitting open and and I'm on the ground and and I just kinda got back in the car and I felt really like a failure like I had even failed at killing myself the only reason I think I didn't try again I was less than six months away from going away to college and I thought at that point I thought well maybe maybe something will change when I go away Sarah graduated from high school and went to college when her dorm roommates showed up, they couldn't have been more different than Sarah. I met two little Christian girls. They just came in and talked about God in a way that I had really never seen before. I, they really believed in God, and they really loved Him. And that, uh, 
I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, I don't remember them ever having a conversation with me saying that, you know, I was, you know, I was wrong or I needed to do this or I needed to do that. It was never that. They just lived their life. The girls started a Bible study in their room. Sarah found herself listening as she pretended to do homework. They invited her to a campus Christian InterVarsity meeting. I decided to go. I figured, what do I have to lose? And I still remember the sermon, almost word for word. He talked about altars in the Bible. The reason that we had to lay down our lives on those altars for God was because God loved me. Me. And to me, that was completely new. After the meeting, Sarah found a quiet place on campus to think about what she had heard. I just, I just laid it out. I said, I said, God, if, if you're real and you really do want me, then I'll be yours. I'll be yours. When she went home during Thanksgiving break, Sarah says that although things were still the same at home, she realized that the change she was looking for had begun in her. And I read the Bible the whole break, and I remember being at peace for the first time in my life. But Sarah still had some occult paraphernalia. It was stored at her parents' house. I had a big bonfire and burned everything because, and that to me was the only, the only thing I knew how to do to demonstrate to God that, like, I didn't want anything to do with that world, and I was shutting that door for good. Sarah is now a wife and mother of three daughters. She hasn't forgotten her struggle for identity as a young person and is the author of a series of books for teenage girls. She says that she will never forget how God came to her rescue when she was crying out for a new life. Satan confused me into, and, and deceived me into thinking that I actually had to kill myself to receive that new life. My mother consults the dead. She she consults with her spiritual guides. She can actually take a glass of water, and in a glass of water, she will see your past. Barbara Arthur comes from a long line of spirit mediums. Even while she was still in the womb, her mother dedicated her to follow in the family tradition. It was a way of life, but it was very fearful. I remember that I was visited by a group of demons. I was awakened with my feet being held off the bed, and, a, and, and the presence of fear that filled my room and this, and this demon was actually looking at me. And I turned my head to the right and my room was full of demons and they were to be my spiritual guide. When Barbara was four, she fled Cuba with her father and two younger siblings. They made their home in America. By the time she was in the sixth grade, the burden of running a household was too much for the young girl. Her teacher, a Christian, sympathized with her and explained that God loved her and sent his son Jesus to die for her sins. Jesus became very real to me, and I was in love with Jesus at 11, but because my friends were calling me a fanatic, I just stopped reading the Bible that my teacher gave me. When Barbara turned 13, the responsibilities at home became too much. I was tired of being mom, and I wanted out. And so I, the only way I knew without hurting my dad was to get married. So with her father's permission, she married when she was just 13 years old. She moved in with her new husband and his parents. Before long, she realized something was eerily familiar about their home. It was demonic. His mother and he were both very much involved in the occult. One evening, we got into a, an argument, and he started to call his spirits, if you will, and I felt them on the bed. I was 14 years old. He kept me imprisoned at home. He would not allow me to go to the store. He would not allow me to go outside. Barbara was 15 when she divorced her young husband and moved back in with her dad. She turned to the only place she knew for guidance, a medium in their neighborhood. She told me that I was going to have a child. And I became enamored with the idea of having a child. And so I allowed myself to get pregnant when I was 17. She married her boyfriend and had a baby girl. But Barbara's new husband was abusive, and in less than a year, she was divorced again. Barbara then married a third time to a man who was also abusive. So she left and once again looked to the occult for guidance and comfort. But when she ran out of money and couldn't pay the medium, she feared that the very power she sought for help would turn against her. 
Barbara thought back to her sixth grade teacher. She remembered how much she loved Jesus and decided he was her only hope. The next Sunday, she took her daughter to church. But I sat in the very last pew of that church and I cried out to God. I said, oh God, help me. I'm going to die. And he spoke to my heart. And he said, ask Jesus to come into your heart. And then he said, repent of your sins. And I said, forgive me for my sins. I felt like I lived my life in a black plastic bag and for the first time I could see the sunlight. And the joy was awesome. To make ends meet, Barbara started working as a model. Not long after that, her mother moved to the States. It was absolutely wonderful to see her, but she's a practicing medium. And she tells me that her gifting is a gift from God. As a new Christian, Barbara still didn't realize that witchcraft was wrong. It was at a Bible study one night that she learned the truth about her mom's beliefs. It woke me up. When I walked into my apartment, I cleaned house. Everything that my mother had given me for good luck or that this tarot card woman had uh, told me to purchase for good spirits to draw near, I put everything in a bag and I got rid of everything. She opened her Bible to Luke and read the story of the prodigal son. And the Lord reminded me that when I was in the sixth grade, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. But since my sister and my friends had persecuted me that I dropped him, and that day, he revealed to me that he had never taken his hand or his eyes off of me, that he allowed me to reach the end of myself, that I would turn back to him. And he was waiting for me with open arms. And I wept and wept and wept at the revelation of the love of God. And I fell in love with his love. I fell in love with his love. And all I wanted was to know this awesome God that was working so awesome in my life. Once Barbara learned the truth about witchcraft, she studied the Bible voraciously. The danger of allowing these um, occult things in your life, whether it's a book or whether it's a movie or, or watching TV shows or computer games, whatever it is, is there's a fascination with the supernatural. And it, it opens the door to the enemy. And God has commanded us. It's not a suggestion. He's commanded us not to have anything to do with that because he wants to protect us. Today, Barbara is married, this time to a Christian man. I'm just extremely grateful for that, that he took someone like me and that he's brought me to a place where he calls me the daughter of the King Most High. And I know him. I walk with him, that I can know the God that has created the whole universe. It does not get better than that. For years, Annie delved in the occult, called herself a witch. I looked the part. I had the powers. I embraced it. I was seeing demons. It just completely enveloped my life. The darkness did. As a child, Annie loved music and theater, but others saw her as being different. I was always the bunt of every joke, and nobody seemed to want to embrace anything I wanted to do. And so it was just kind of pent up that I don't belong, I don't fit in, and it makes me angry Then I'm going to get even with everybody eventually. She remembers the night she was given the power to do that. It wasn't long after she had started playing with the Ouija board. I felt something in the room, and then I saw something dark come across the ceiling and it started descending down on me kind of like a blanket. I was never the same. It did give me like an edge and I enjoyed that, that sense of this is how I can be popular is by being different. By her teen years, she was reading tarot cards, predicting the future, and says she could even transport her body and move things with her mind. It got people's attention, but not their friendship. I always had this depression and oppression inside me. I wanted to be the homecoming queen. I, I wanted to be you know, the head cheerleader. I, I wanted to be this person. And I, no matter how hard I tried to be, I couldn't be that girl. In college, she numbed her pain with drugs and alcohol. The dark presence was still there, often appearing as a man in a black cape. He would talk to me through my mind and console me and tell me that I was powerful. Still, Annie could only see darkness and despair. She dropped out of college and moved to Hollywood to pursue acting and singing. But nothing panned out. 
So one day, she closed up her apartment, opened the gas burners on her stove, and waited to die. I just wanted everything to go away. I felt that rejection had just built up. I was never going to be popular. I was never going to be pretty. I was always going to be a failure. Annie was barely conscious when a friend happened to stop by and took her outside. Then, looking for a fresh start, she moved to Las Vegas. There, she joined a rock band and started dating Peter, the band's bass player. I have this, um, this guy that's, that just is really interested in me and loves me and thinks I'm beautiful, and I felt like the real special one for a change. But when Peter started going to church, he confronted her about her witchcraft. Then he gave her an ultimatum. He said, I, it's, it's an abomination to God. And I told him, I said, I beg to differ because God made me this way. And he's all, he's, he thinks it's okay that I'm a witch. And he said, I'm going to serve God with you or without you. Thinking the relationship was over, Annie blamed God for losing Peter and everything else that had gone wrong in her life. I was pretty much furious. I was jumping up and down and screaming and shaking my fist like this. You know, now you've taken a man that I love and I, I've had enough. And that's when oh, something so strong spoke to me that you have a choice, Annie. You can either walk to me now or you can walk away from me forever. Annie says she knew right away that voice was God's. So one Sunday, she went to church with Peter. The pastor gave an invitation. He said, who wants to wipe the slate clean? Who wants to start all over? And that sounded so good to me. Then she said a simple prayer. Please forgive me of my sins and, you know, that I believe that Jesus died on the cross and then he rose on the third day. And it was as though as I was taken and plunged into a waterfall. And uh, instantly, I felt like a new person, like everything had turned white. Like, like all the dirtiness was being flushed off of me. It was just so glorious of a feeling of warmth and love. Annie stopped using drugs and burned everything she owned that was associated with the occult. Eventually, she and Peter married. The dark presence tried to come back in her life numerous times, but it finally got the message. And I said, I belong to Jesus Christ now, and you're not going to bother me anymore. It all ended. It's like the darkness was cast out by the bright light. Jesus offered me peace, and he offered me a deep-seated joy that no matter what I go through, I have the courage to face it. Night becomes light. Now Annie is a Christian recording artist and a worship leader at her church. This Christmas, she encourages anyone who needs a new start to accept God's gift of hope through Jesus Christ. You're never going to get rid of that desperation of darkness until you accept Jesus. Jesus never leaves our side, never turns his back on us. And to have that feeling of knowing that he's always there, it changes everything for you. Brooke Gardner was only 11 when persistent feelings of hopelessness put her on the verge of suicide. Her parents took her to a psychiatrist who prescribed medication, but it did little to alleviate her despair. Really just numbed me. It made me, I didn't have any thoughts or really feelings anymore. Um, kind of just walked around like a zombie. After a year, she searched for other ways to cope with her depression. I had started um, looking online about spells and about uh, Wicca and went and bought some spell books. I started doing these spells in my room. I was burning lots of sage, and, and um, you know, I thought they were positive spells, and they were going to help my depression. I thought that by controlling the environment that I could control my feelings. Performing the spells also gave her a sense of power. I just wanted to connect to something more powerful. Um, you want to be bigger and um, better than a lot of the people around you. You know, everyone better stay away from me, or you're going to get it. But one night, Brooke discovered the magic she thought was helping her and invited an unexpected presence into her life. I was sleeping, and beside me was this, like, dark figure. 
and it was like touching the bed and um, like right beside me. I don't know if it, what it was doing or why it, it like had one of its hands on me. And I woke up and I like still felt something with its hand on me. At that moment, I couldn't even scream or make a noise. I was so scared that whatever this was was still in the room. You know, after a while, it went away. Despite her fear, Brooke continued practicing witchcraft, and her condition only got worse. I didn't feel more powerful. Um, actually, really more so, I felt powerless, and I felt like a failure. It didn't make me feel any better than what I was. It just got me deeper and deeper into depression. Brooke lived with a debilitating depression for three years, going on and off various medications. Then, when she was 14, she woke up one morning to find something had changed. I told the doctor, I said, listen, I don't know what happened. Um, I don't know how it happened, but I no longer have depression and never experienced that state of depression or that oppression again. It was gone. But what remained was her need to have meaning and control in her life. And while she kept casting spells, she also started reading her father's dusty King James Bible hoping she might find some answers there. I read in the book of Leviticus how God's not pleased with people who practice witchcraft and practice that kind of thing. So that's what really gripped me, uh, really believing all my life that it was okay to do those things. So after that, I took all my books, everything that I had that had to do with it, and I threw them all in the trash and just turned away from, from all of those things. A short time later, she was watching television and discovered a program she had never seen before. It was the 700 Club. I'd hear some of the testimonies of miracles and healings, and it just kind of opened my eyes to um, this whole other place of, of what I really desired and, and wanted inside. And So after watching it several, several times, I would pray um, with, with Pat on the TV and um, ask Christ to, to come into my life. Brooke called the CBN prayer line to confess Jesus as her savior. It was something I'd never experienced in my life. It was for once in my life, all the sin that I had in my heart, all the stuff that I've ever done was forgiven. It was just a complete, complete change. I would look at a flower and be like, wow, like I can't believe God created this flower. Um, just, I felt a complete release and just a huge weight taken off of me. And I knew that I was right with God. I looked back at those times where God was in those little, those moments. Um, when I woke up that morning and didn't have depression anymore, I, I knew that that was God healing me and healing my mind and healing that oppression that was on me at that time. Brooke attended Bible college and today runs a music cafe that ministers to children and youth. She has the peace of mind she always longed for and a hope that never fades. He died so that you can have forgiveness and you can have restoration with him in, in a relationship. There's no greater choice or decision that I've ever made in my life um, than to accept him into my life as my savior. You, uh, you, you broke into a realm where you could leave your body? Explain right, that. Right, right. I can astral project. I could throw my hand through glass and not be cut. I could put a match under my hand and not be burned. I could do all kinds of different things. One particular time I had a couple of friends of mine who went and got saved. And I mean, they were really saved. And I, and I didn't like the idea they got saved because I felt like they left me there in that realm. And so I sent out a, a couple of spirits after them. And I said, you go there and you curse them. You destroy everything they're doing. Those little spirits came back to me and they said, we can't touch them. I said, go back and put a curse on them. I command you, orders you to do so. And they came back to me again and said, we can't touch them. They're protected. So I asked you to project out of my own body. And I went to see the reason why I tell these spirits and then they come back. And I know I've sent them to do other things and they never had a problem. So I went to see for myself. And when I got there, I saw the two, the two brothers who were walking around this particular place, and I saw these seven, almost eight foot tall angels with swords was, was protecting them every way they went. And I said, wow, that's the reason why those spirits came back and couldn't do anything. These guys got some way stronger than I have, and these guys were protected. I mean, protected by giant angels. 
Nancy Dunn was raised in what looked like the typical American family. I lived in California. My father worked for the aerospace industry. My mother worked for a doctor. And so, you know, on the outside, everything looked just normal, but nobody really knew what was going on behind closed doors. My father was actually a Satanist high priest, so he um, did all kinds of evil things. He sexually assaulted me. He took me to satanic rituals. My father actually used me as a baby breeder, which means I was impregnated to carry a child so that the Satanists would have a baby to sacrifice to the devil in their satanic rituals. As soon as I was able to have a baby, I was pregnant. The abuse in Nancy's home continued throughout her adolescence. Her babies were delivered by midwives, and there was no record of their births. And so if I were out of school for weeks or months on end, my parents could call the school and there was no big deal. There was never an investigation. However, back when she was eight years old, an elderly neighbor befriended Nancy and invited her to church. My parents let me go because they were doing a Olympic type event where kids were competing and playing. So she took me to that meeting and it was really awesome to me because at eight years old, uh, one of the ladies there preached the gospel to me. She shared with me who Jesus was. And that very day, in that very moment, I knew that was the truth. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. At age 18, she married the first man that came along to escape her abusive upbringing. When her marriage fell apart one year later, she began to lead a promiscuous lifestyle. But I became pregnant at 21 years old, and I was alone. So a friend offered me a solution, and I had an abortion. After the abortion, the guilt and shame of her decision, and a flood of traumatic childhood memories sent Nancy running back to the church. I really loved God in my heart, but I didn't really know how to have that walk with Him. So I joined a church. I began to read the Word of God. I began to really pursue a relationship with my Heavenly Father. Um, as I began to try to walk that out, there were all these stumbling blocks at times. It felt like there was a wall or a ceiling between God and I. There was a lot of fear in my life, a lot of anxiety in my life. My self-esteem was just nothing. I always felt that I was just lower than the dirt. And I couldn't really ever understand why God would love me or what His love could do for me. And I just began to press into God for my deliverance. And I just began to cry out to God with all I had all the time for my freedom. And it was a process of about a year and a half that I was in counseling, working with this therapist. And I remember visiting a church on Valentine's Day. They were preparing the elements for communion. And I was getting a little nervous inside because in the natural, I was forced to drink human blood in the satanic rituals. So the blood seems so crazy to me. But I heard the Lord speak to me, and He said, If you will drink of my blood and eat of my body, I will heal you from everything the enemy has done to you. So I took communion, and everything changed, and I became one whole person. God did it in a moment through communion. After taking communion, the Lord also led Nancy through a process of forgiving her father. The next time she saw him, he was on his deathbed. He was in ICU. They didn't think he could speak to me. And yet, he sat up in the bed. He sat up in the bed, and he repented to me. Well, I just lost it. I, I just totally lost it. And I just looked at my father, and I said, You know, Dad, all I want to know is if you know Jesus. And he said, he looked at me and smiled, and he said that he had just said the sinner's prayer with a neighbor who was a pastor. And I just had tears flowing down my face, and I said, um, the only thing I want is how I need to hear you say it. And so my father said the sinner's prayer with me, and about 60 seconds later, he died, and he went to heaven. 
Today, Nancy is an advocate for abused and neglected children in the court system. She has also helped start orphanages in five different nations and travels the world to share her story and minister deliverance. I'm free. I feel so free. I feel so light. I feel so happy. And God's allowing me to be a part of setting other people free. You know, I just want to say there's power in the blood of Jesus. And the blood has never lost its power. And it will never lose its power. Jesus didn't come and shed his blood so we'd remain in captivity. He came and shed his blood that we would be free. And I'm telling you, God wants us free. Christine McGuire was deeply involved in the occult and ghost hunting. But one night she realized she was in way over her head. I went in there and it was a very active night. We had some very strange things happen. And I realized that there was a, a demon in this place. Even though she was a full-fledged witch, Christine still considered herself a Christian. Her husband Tom explains. She had blended Christianity with witchcraft, um, which we've now come to know as a term as syncretism, which is taking different religious and religions and blending them together. Basically, I just ignored what the Bible said in certain parts and read the rest of it to be what I wanted it to mean and folded it into uh, witchcraft. Christine was raised in a Christian home. But when she and Tom started having problems in their marriage, they questioned their faith. That's when things started to kind of fall apart in our marriage and in um, uh, our relationship with God. After Tom had an emotional affair with a woman online, he and Christine separated. I felt abandoned by God. I didn't have control over my own destiny. And I wanted to connect with a feminine energy. I wanted to connect with a goddess. And so I felt that feminine energy. I think that's why I was so drawn to it, because it appealed to me as a woman. Over the next five years, Christine dove deeper into witchcraft. But she couldn't shake the feeling that God was trying to get her attention. The Holy Spirit, he just prodded me from day one he would uh, you know I say he was poking me with a stick you know trying to help me to come to my senses because you know I I knew what I was doing was wrong but I chose to ignore that she eventually started ghost hunting by that time I was a medium and communicating with spirits on my own and I, I was watching this going oh I could do that so I got on the internet and I searched ghost hunting groups in my area at the same time Tom rededicated his life to God and tried to reconcile with Christine I called and told her that I thought we ought to get back together um, that God had a greater plan than what we had we were reunited and he knew I was a ghost hunter a medium and a witch so I decided this time I would just kind of go with the flow and I would pray for her a lot and just kind of be that pillar for her. Christine refused to change, but one night she realized that her choices could have severe consequences. I realized that there was a, a demon in this place. At one point, I felt like I should command the spirit to leave in the name of Jesus. There was an authority that I hadn't used in years. In the name of Jesus, you are going to leave. You're uninvited. Now he's going to go where Jesus sends him. The interesting thing was, we didn't hear anything happen at that time. But a few days later, I got an email with a, a file attached to it that had an EVP on it, an electro, electronic voice phenomenon. And it happened to be a cl the clip from when I told the spirit it had to leave in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, you are going to leave. You're uninvited. <laughs> now he's going to go where Jesus sends him and not come back. And what you hear is what can only be described as a scream. It was the strangest thing I've ever heard. It scared me, to be quite honest. Um, because it, it sounded inhuman. 
I had just heard a demon react to the true, honest power of Jesus' name. Um, I sent the, the file to my husband. Being an audio engineer, I took it into my laptop and I looked at it in the waveforms to see, okay, who edited this and, you know, where's the edit happened? And it's not there. So this is like a real clip of audio. And so it really, it freaked her out. And uh, she started realizing that there was power in Jesus' name. And he wasn't just, you know, a good guy that she should listen to, but that he was the Son of God. Christine knew then that she could never combine witchcraft and spiritualism with Christianity. I realized that I had been fooled. I'd given myself over to demons. And it was at that moment that I literally got down on my face and just poured my heart out to the Lord and begged for His forgiveness. And I renounced everything that I had been involved in. Tom knew that God had answered him. I believe in the power of prayer, and so I figured that just praying a lot, eventually things would turn around. I had faith that God could do it. That meant more to me than anything, to know that my husband, he just accepted me where I was at, at that time, and loved me enough to trust me to God's hands. Today, she warns others about the dangers of the occult. You might not necessarily be involved or even dabbling in magic or ghost hunting or anything like that, but you start reading about it, you start watching television programs, you start watching movies, searching on the internet, and so I think probably the most important thing I would say is read the Bible and understand the power that is behind these things in the occult because it's a very real power. It's very real and its only intent is our spiritual destruction. I'm so thankful and grateful for God pulling me out of that deception and out of that life of harassment that I didn't even realize I was living. There is nothing like the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus, uh, it saves, it forgives, it loves. Jesus is everything. I was seeking something real because I wanted to see something that was tangible. I wanted to see something that was, was able to work in my life now. It was supernatural power Sean Patrick Williams wanted. He grew up attending church, but never saw a God of power working in his own life. At 14, Sean began using LSD. By 17, when his parents divorced, he was a drug addict living on the streets. At times he blamed God for his world falling apart, and then he took a dangerous turn to the dark side. At that time, I just basically just cursed God, had these, these desires, I said, basically made a pact with Satan that if he'd you know, do these certain things for me, he could have my soul. Soon after his vow, Sean Patrick's life began to change. He became a drug dealer. Then he began to meet people that claimed to have the power he wanted. They worshiped Satan. I started dating a girl that was into Wiccan religion. And through that process, I uh, had people that were, you know, casting spells and you know, reading my tarot cards. His reputation as a drug dealer grew, and so did his obsession for power. I had already had a affiliate, drug affiliate with the Dixie Mafia, the Mexican Mafia, all different Hells Angels. I, you know, I was selling drugs, interaction with all these people, and so over time, I, I became personal friends with people that were, you know, in um, a preacher in a church of Satan. His lucrative drug deals helped him buy his own business, a bar. Soon, a successful nightclub owner approached Sean and asked him to become a business partner. The man guaranteed Sean millions in profits, but there was a catch. His business partner practiced Santeria, a form of Satanism involving animal sacrifice. As part of the deal, Sean Patrick was obliged to join. One evening at the man's nightclub, Sean was prepared to make that step. I knew what they were, they were getting me to the point to a ritual to, you know, the blood sacrifice and, and um, setting me up for this point. So here I am over, over this time period, um, I'm like intrigued 
about, I'm ready, I'm pretty much at the point where I, I, it's either I'm all the way in or I'm all the way out. And so they took me up into a DJ booth and there's about four or five hundred people dancing there. And he says, now here I am, I'm, I'm high on ecstasy, I'm high on cocaine, I'm drinking. He turned around and, and as he turned around, he looked and he held his arms out, looked in my eyes and said, what do you think? It was then the man offered Sean riches in the business world if he would seal his deal with Satan with the blood sacrifice. But at that moment, Sean's mind cleared. The haze of drugs fell away, and he heard something he'd never heard before. And when he turns around like that, uh, a, a voice spoke into, to my spirit. It was like my consciousness. And it was just as plain as day. It said, heaven's real and hell's real, and you've got to make a choice. And for the first time in years, here I am standing under the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm convicted of sin. I'm clear in my mind. I'm not high. And I'm sitting here looking at him, and I'm thinking, how in the world did I get here? I said, oh, God, will you help me? At that moment, I said, God, I'm a drug addict, and I'm worthless here. But if you'll take my life, I'll give it to you, and I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to. As soon as the door opened up, God got me out of there, and I never came back. I never tried to call him again. And until nine months later, I found out the bar had shut down. Sean also kicked his drug habit and amazingly never experienced withdrawal symptoms. The power of the Holy Spirit to bring me through deliverance for no DTs, no relapses, to make those desires go away, there's power in that. I tried to do it three or four times on my own. I couldn't. While Sean Patrick's initial turn from evil was immediate, a spiritual battle in his home lasted for nine more months. I had things happen like my bed levitating off the ground and I'm scared, I'm scared, you know, hiding under the sheets and, I, and I'm never experienced anything like this. But I finally got so sick of being scared that I just got up out of my bed and I said, you know what, you fine, go ahead and kill me. I'm going to live for Jesus and I'm going to be in heaven and you got to go and you got to leave in the name of Jesus. The demonic activity in his home vanished that night. Sean Patrick began to read the Bible constantly. I wasn't grounded in a good church at that moment yet, and I was just had my Bible. I was resting. I would find a scripture, and I would rest in it, and I would just stand on the scripture. Sean was still running a bar, so he read his Bible at work. I'd lay it out on the bar, and in between serving customers, man, I would just have it out there. And so I would read the scripture and, and just wait on the customers, and it was the only thing that would keep those desires from over, overtaking my mind. Now, he says he's found the ultimate power in Jesus Christ. When I met him and when I gave my life to him and had my, my encounter with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus, um, that was power. The things that he showed me was that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask or think because that's his nature, you know, he's, he's power. Stephen Beatty was a self-professed warlock. As a Wiccan, he cast spells and had several dark demonic encounters. His trek to the dark side began in 2001, when his girlfriend had a miscarriage. When it didn't work out and the baby was stillborn, I was completely crushed. I had no idea where to go, where to turn. I couldn't think. All I could think about was how badly and how much I wanted this child. Stephen blamed God for his baby's death. It pushed me away from God because somebody told me that God had a reason for taking this child. And I thought, I don't want to have any part in a God who will take a child from somebody who wants it. Partly due to the miscarriage, his relationship with his girlfriend ended. Stephen was totally broken. He turned to drinking and drugs to mask the anger in his soul. I'd started getting into cocaine and prescription drugs, painkillers antidepressants and stuff like that. Stephen said he felt like an outcast until he entered the world of goth. That's where he met and married Dottie, who had two girls from a previous marriage. They didn't care what I was doing. They didn't care what I looked like, and they didn't care how I acted. I remember wearing two to three inch spikes around my neck, three, four inch spikes on my wrist. Stephen, Dottie, and their goth friends also participated in intricate role-playing games. They had different roles like vampires, werewolves, a mage, which was a witch. They had what they called dark angels. And that opened the door to something even darker, the occult. At first, I didn't want anything to do with it. But the more I hung out and the more I was there, I think I started searching for some kind of religious stability. 
because I needed a set of beliefs to live by. And I didn't want to change my life. So Wicca kind of fit the bill at the time. The Wiccan rituals and spells opened him up to what he calls demonic encounters. One day at his home, Stephen and some friends noticed an object, a knife, moving on its own. It started spinning and nobody was touching it. And one of my friends looked at me, he said, did you see that? And I said, yes. And everybody that was in the house left. Months later, he had an encounter he would never forget. In the dead center of my room, there was a dark figure just kind of sitting like cross-legged. I was just sitting there looking at me, levitated off the floor. It gives you chills. And it was really scary. Stephen was terrified when he saw the power of Satan. He knew his life needed to change. Then one day while attending his stepdaughter's soccer practice, he met another dad, a pastor who invited him to church. I said, I'm going to tell you why I don't go to church. I said, I'm a witch. I believe in Wicca. And he just looked, he looks at me and he says, well, how's that working out for you? And I said, not too good. The pastor gave him a Bible and Stephen began reading. And then on Easter Sunday, he went to church to see his stepdaughter sing in the choir. That was the day his life totally changed. It was just the music, the songs, and just the message. It was just the way the story of Christ was laid out. That it really, it really made me understand that, that I needed Christ in my life and that I was a sinner. Stephen began to pray. I told God that I knew that I was wrong in the way that I lived, that everything about my life was wrong and I needed forgiveness and just wanted Jesus, I just wanted Christ in my heart and in my life. It was an overnight change. I had already given up almost everything from my past. I was still drinking, but it was like overnight. I didn't want to drink anymore. My language cleared up. Just the way that I carried myself, it was an overnight change. Others saw the change in Stephen too. Pastor Nate Blackledge explains. Anytime you talk to him, it just seems like the, the number one thing on his heart is what he can do to be used by God, to see God do a work in not necessarily his own life, but anybody's life that he comes in contact with. It's, it's amazing. Stephen and Dottie have since had a child of their own. They're amazed at all that God has done for their family. Without his grace and his mercy, I wouldn't be here now. I just don't believe that I would have made it through what I've come through without him. God is my strong tower. I find my strength in Him. Without Him, I am nothing. The oracle, as you put your hand on it, would just move around. Well, my brother's a jokester. You know, I thought he's doing it. And he's con trying to convince me he's not doing this. But what I did, uh, I took the Ouija board by myself up to my bedroom one night. But the Ouija board still answered his questions, and Jeff knew some other force was at work. It scared me, but at the same time, it was kind of like a roller coaster ride. You're scared to death, but you're thrilled. I began to recognize after this that there was a, uh, a presence that began to develop in my house. I mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night and literally feel someone's watching me. And I would wake up and, and literally walk through the house in order to experience that because I liked it. And normally a kid in third grade or second grade or whatever mm. wakes up and feels some presumably dark <clears throat> presence in the room, doesn't want to get up and walk around the house at night alone to right. feel it or check it out. Right. Well, I, I based this experience on the fact that I knew that there was more. There was something. There was... Uh, the other side. Jeff was soon closer to the presence than he was to his own alcoholic father. I mean, I was just, I was unhappy as a, as a kid. I, I didn't want to be where I was. I didn't want to be in the family I was in. So I was looking for an escape. I was looking for literally the possibility of something else, anything else, because my life is, I'll be honest with you, it's hell. 
You know, I mean, here I am, the town drunk's kid, being abused, uh, being neglected. I, I didn't feel loved. Soon after his experience with the Ouija board, the presence Jeff felt in his home spoke to him. I woke up one night, um, and literally, it was there was like a voice behind my, my ear saying, Jeff, come, you know, come here, I got something to show you. This strange force took Jeff on out-of-body experiences. During these times, he saw things days before he experienced them in real life. Then Jeff met a man who happened to be a practicing Satanist. He prayed over me and laid hands on me. And when he laid hands on me, I was filled with a demon. Jeff believed Satanism was the path to honing his paranormal abilities. And when a demon is around you or is inside of you, uh, the sensation or the sense of their presence, you lie to yourself. You think that that's your power level. He and his new teacher formed their own coven and recruited other teens to join them. I saw each and every one of them become demon possessed. And I noticed something in my heart. My heart felt for them. It was like I was convicted. I knew it was wrong. It was like I knew this, this shouldn't be happening. I fought that because I'm a Satanist. I don't care about anybody or anything but me. I mean, here I am, a caring Satanist, you know. So I began to ritually try to kill this part of me that's alive, this heart, this, this part of me that, that cares. No matter what they tried, Jeff and the demonic forces inside him just couldn't kill that little seed of love and compassion. So the demons that had given him power for so many years turned on Jeff and tried to kill him instead. The demons inside of me literally began to uh, torment me. I mean, turned against me and, and, and against each other, sending me through hell. Jeff decided the only way to escape the torment was to kill himself. Got me a gun and went down to my motel and put the gun against my head. And when I looked down the barrel of that gun, the thought in my mind, where are you gonna spend eternity? came out of nowhere. I couldn't pull the trigger. The next day, Jeff tried to hang himself, but the rope slipped. He went to bed sobbing. Again, he heard a voice, but this time it was different. The voice came from, I mean, right here next to me and said, get out. And I knew it wasn't demonic. It was different. And what I did was I got out of bed and I didn't even think about walking through the house and going out the back door. I opened up my, my window and stepped out my window. And I'll be honest with you, when I stepped out my window, I was, I was in a completely different presence. And, and I knew it was God. There was this incredible presence of power, but love. I knew that that power that had been pursuing me, who wouldn't let me die, was present. Here is the love that you've always wanted, always needed, that you've always been searching for. And you went looking for it in the wrong place because you didn't have it, you turned to darkness. Now here it is. Well, I just looked up in the sky and I just said, Jesus, make my life okay. Though he had just given his life to Christ, Jeff still had to deal with the demons. He had been performing elaborate satanic rituals for years, but all it took to get rid of the demons was the simple prayer of a woman he met at church. And she just started praying, she, Harry, and myself, and she just started praying, and the demons inside of me just, just came up and literally turned my head, and I looked at her, and she looked at the demons, and she just said, in the name of Jesus, go. And they left. It was like that. And I ran to find a mirror, and I looked at myself for the first time in four years. Because every day I shaved, I saw the demons, Finally, I'm free. I light up my candles. I spit the rum. I spit the cigar smoke. The cigar smoke means power. If I didn't have money for a roof, I'd cut myself and use my own blood and pour it in. The whole atmosphere of the room changes. And you know there's something there. And then when it's there, you have to dress him like a family member, my father. I'm here, what would you like to speak to me about? What is it that you want me to do? 
As time went on, John also practiced the dark arts outside his apartment. He preyed on Christians in particular. At the clubs, I would go around looking for Christians. And I knew that in the club, you was in the devil's playground. So I knew that if I can get into it and you had a beer tour ready in your system, I knew all I had to do was just say, listen, I have something to tell you today. And right now you will open the door and you said, what is it you need to tell me? You gave me gateway. Eventually, John became a high priest in Palo Mayambe, a form of African spiritualism. As he became more powerful, John took warfare seriously. The devil told me that I had to go into the neighborhood in the spirit round in order to weaken it in the natural. Whatever you kill in the spirit round, you can kill in the natural. So I will leave my body home and I should project myself in different boroughs, different regions, different states, different countries. And as I followed the neighborhood, I would speak curses into the neighborhood, speak things that I wanted to happen into the neighborhood. Sometimes I will go into neighborhoods and I see this group of people in the spirit in the corner praying, holding hands, heads bowed, praying up a storm. And there was no accomplishment in that neighborhood. That neighborhood was sanctified, blessed through prayer. There was, you couldn't touch it. But the other neighborhoods, it was party time. Around that time, John met a girl who intrigued him. I said, well, you know, I can hang out with her. She's good looking. And she invited me to church. She also invited John to meet her parents, who talked to him about Jesus. They had the Bible out. Hey, listen, we want to talk to you about this. I'm like, oh, I can't come to your house. Your parents are crazy. I said, now at least let me digest the food, and then you can talk about this Jesus guy. And then after I leave her, I will go to worship. I will go to the devil church and kill animals all night long. And then I will come back and see her, but she didn't know. John found the Christians amusing and harmless. We had a different system that they had. Their stuff was just kisses, hallelujah, we love you. So I kept coming to church to please her, but I wasn't going to leave people I was committed to. One Sunday morning, the pastor gave an altar call. John went forward, but wasn't prepared for what happened next. I said, well, the devil can't touch me here. I'm in front of the pastor now. I'm protected. All of a sudden. I got demon possessed. I got them by the throat, picked them up in there, and said, I came for you. And all these big men came out. So he tried to grab me. I was just throwing people around like right guards. And then 200-something people got up and raised up hands. Spiritual warfare for a person that would have killed them on a heartbeat. I saw the power of God in the church. One of the guys was whispering back in my ear and say, say Jesus is Lord, say Jesus is Lord, say it, say it. Jesus. I couldn't open my mouth. And then Jesus suddenly I was able to say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And the devil left. John was embarrassed about the outburst, but not sure what to do next. One of the church elders approached him a few days later. He said, Jesus wants you to have this. He gave me a sweatshirt. They said, you're a warrior for Christ. For someone to come and say, this is a gift in Christ, because he loves you. To me, that was amazing. I couldn't believe that Jesus loved me. But I was committed to the dark side. I was committed to the demons. I was committed to the devil and I was between two worlds. One night, John decided to end the struggle between the two worlds the only way he knew how. I said, well, if Jesus can't have me, the devil can't have me, the best way I'd suicide. In my ignorance, in my shame, in my, in my mind that was so far gone, spiritually drained, very spiritually drained. John didn't know how to pray, but he began to talk to God. I don't know what they call you, Jesus, whatever they call you in church. I don't like you. I never liked you. I, I never had nothing to do with you. I want no dealings with you. I hate you. I don't want to be part of you. I, don't want to, I never want to be a Christian. I disown you. If that's going to get you away from me, I will worship the devil to the day I die. I whisper saying, if you are bigger than the God that I serve, then you show me tonight or leave me alone. John went to sleep and dreamed he was on a subway. The train was filled with people and their faces were drained, and we were going somewhere that I know that was not good. And as the train was going faster than light, there was a lady dressed very elegant, and she started talking to me in demonic tongues. I understood the tongue, traitor, you're leaving us. 
So I try to get into the middle of the train, in the middle of the people, so she won't reach me. Pop hit. And the doors open, I ended up in hell. John stepped out of the subway and into the darkness. As I went to the tunnels of hell, the heat wasn't a heat that you feel on earth. It grips you in the fear, ropes around you. There's no hope, the hope is removed. As I got to part of the tunnel, the devil came out, bigger and more strong, i never seen him like that. And he said to me, I've been with you since you were nine years old. I've been a father to you. I've given you everything. He said, I'm gonna keep you here, because if I can keep you here, you won't wake up upstairs, which is on earth. And he said, you belong to me, and you're not gonna leave. You know too many secrets about my religion. And when he went to grab me, just snuffed me, this three foot cross would appear in my hands. I can't understand how a cross would appear in my hands. I never called for the cross. I put it on the devil. And he felt like nothing. He felt like he was a, a baby. No powers at the foot of the cross. When John woke up, he was a changed man. And I knew that Jesus was the Lord. I bent my knee to the cross. And Jesus came into my life. I took a white piece of paper and I wrote down a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. I serve you all the days of my life. John threw out all of his witchcraft paraphernalia, but the battle wasn't over. He was under spiritual attack every night for the next month. At night, I felt a presence come into the room. And then when I would turn around, I would actually sometimes see what was there. Or sometimes I would just slip around and somehow fall asleep up this way and I would just feel someone's hands just grab me by my throat and try to pick me off of bed and try to rip my body. I rip my soul out of my body. Sometimes they grab by my feet and the bed would shake and it would bring it up and levitate the bed and levitate me to the point that I was sometimes I might even reach the ceiling and I couldn't breathe and I couldn't cry out. I couldn't talk. I felt like I was choking. I felt like they were choking the life out of me and I would try to call out for Jesus and the words wouldn't come out. And then in the end of the words come out, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, saves me, and it will go away. John didn't understand why God permitted the nightly struggles. I asked the Lord, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why this torment? Why did you allow these people to abuse me this way? I gave my life to you. I told you I would serve you. And he said to me, I wanted to know how much you love me, how much you trust me. And no devil ever showed up to my house ever again. John says he wouldn't trade anything for what he's found in Christ. For 25 years of my life, I was able to do anything to anybody. Anyway, I count that out to be foolish. To gain Christ. He's my own all. He's the breath that I breathe. He walks with me. I can hear the sound of his voice in my ear. Today, John shares the gospel with everyone he can. He has written a book about his experiences called Out of the Devil's Cauldron. I've been victorious in Christ. I got peace. I'm not empty no more. I got fulfillment. I got a purpose and I have a destiny today. And all because I said yes to the cross. And I am evangelist for the kingdom of light. No more an evangelist for the dark side. I expose the dark side every time the Lord gives me a chance. Because you don't have to die in your sins. You don't have to shed blood. Like in Palamanyumbe, Jesus shed the blood for you. That's the blood that counts. The one at the cross. I shouldn't have been born. My own mother didn't want me. There must have been something wrong with me because nobody wanted me, you know? Nobody wanted to raise me, love me, take care of me, let me be their daughter. Liberty grew up with deep feelings of rejection after her mother left her and her brother on their father's doorstep. She wanted to party, she wanted to, to do her thing and she couldn't do that with two little babies. And so, you know, she just decided to give us up. After several turbulent years with her father, Liberty moved back in with her mom, who introduced her to drugs and alcohol. At a young age, her mother also exposed her to the occult. She always had a, a large bookshelf 
that was full of uh, witchcraft books with spells, chants, um, ways to curse people. She had tarot cards, a Ouija board, all that. Everything was, that was normal um, in my mom's household. When Liberty was 14, she had an argument with her mother's abusive boyfriend and found herself rejected again. I came home off the bus and there was a box of stuff sitting outside. There was a note that my mom had left that said, um, he's in, you're out. You have to find somewhere else to live. Oh, this is my reality. My mom doesn't love me. She, she never wanted me. She doesn't care. She found acceptance in the party scene and had relationships with men who gave her a place to stay and supplied her with drugs. I did whatever I had to do to survive. I was alone, I was lost. The crystal meth and the drinking was very heavy. I mean, it was a daily thing. It wasn't just like, let's go party on a Friday night. I mean, it was every single day, drinking drugs, drinking drugs, staying up for days. She also began experiencing strange phenomena and some unsettling symptoms. I was hearing voices, I was seeing things. Um, I would get up in the night and I would feel like something was speaking to me and uh, was coming after me. I had sores, uh, little open sores around my body. A friend's parents set up a meeting with their pastor. Liberty reluctantly agreed to see him. I had no belief in God or spiritual beings or anything like that. And he basically just said, all these are symptoms of uh, a demonic attack on you. And the only way to deal with it is rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. Days later, she had a terrifying encounter. These dark images began to just cover the walls and they were like enclosing in on me like they were coming after me. I did what the pastor said and I rebuked in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then the fear was gone and everything I was feeling was gone. It was literally just gone. The demons, everything just disappeared. Liberty says she learned there was power in the name of Jesus, but knew little else about him until a few days later when she was watching TV and came across the 700 Club. Pat Robertson says, you know, is there anyone watching by TV that, you know, if you'd like to ask Jesus into your life, um, pray this prayer with me. I just uh, felt like I needed this Jesus that could make demons flee. I don't have to wait to go to church and be called to the altar. I can just sit right here in my living room and accept Christ, you know. She surrendered her life to Christ, then fell into a deep sleep. When she awoke, she was in a struggle for her life. Something was holding me down and uh, just not letting me up, not letting me speak. It feeling like a hand was over my mouth. I just began to say, Jesus. I was just trying to get the words out. And I said, Jesus. It was very muffled, Jesus. And I felt like it was at the top of my lungs. And, and, and the thing that was covering my mouth just was slowly leaving, like letting go. The last thing I yelled was, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And at that moment, uh, whatever was holding me down removed itself and then I heard this really loud scream like an evil loud wretched squeal sounded as if it was leaving it could no longer reside because Jesus was now the Lord of my life Liberty knew she was free she began to throw away anything that connected her to the darkness she once accepted as normal I knew that the Lord was, was basically in that one moment cleaning up my whole life. He was just like, it's all going, you know, I'm, I'm, you're letting it all go. I'm taking it all away from you. You're being set free. I finally was me. I was never me before. I was never, who's Liberty? You know, who, who's this, this girl that was born? Um, with no purpose, no value, um, no reason to live. He took everything out of me and healed me of, of all the, the horrible things that the world basically dished out on me. My life has changed forever because of that day. 
Today, Liberty co-pastors a church with her husband in Arizona, reaching out to people who need to be set free by the love of God. This is what I've been waiting for my entire life. And this is what it feels like to know a love that you never got, you never received before. I was born for a purpose, and it's to serve Jesus Christ and to do His work. He's the only one that can set you free. Jasmine was born in India to a Sikh family. They moved to America when she was a child. She didn't speak English, and unfortunately, because of her ethnicity, she was the brunt of cruel jokes from the other children. I felt a sense of loss of control of my life, and I wanted to have control of my life. So I thought the more that I could get spiritual experience, the more I would be able to control my environment, and the more I would be able to control people. So I started getting into horoscopes. I started studying about psychics and witchcraft. I would begin to have demons which I didn't know there were demons at the time, revealed themselves to me on a continual basis. And they would just speak to my spirit that I had been born for a purpose and that, for, and that purpose would be fulfilled. As an adult, Yasmin was engrossed in the occult. The experiences that I would have is I wouldn't be satisfied. It would just leave me just more empty. It didn't give me an answer. It gave me power and a, self, and a sense of control, but there was no, no answer for me. She met a man who was involved in the occult. He took her deeper into witchcraft. I moved in with him and uh, we had an, uh, quite an intense connection when it came to spirit to spirit and having the occult draw us together. In our house we would have uh, crystals, uh, huge pictures of Ramses and Pharaoh all over. When her birthday rolled around, she asked a friend for a Shirley MacLaine book. Her friend was a Christian. So she gave me my present and I opened it up and it happened to be a Bible. So I said, oh, where's my book? <laughs> and she said, well, I wanted to show you uh, something in the Bible. And she opened it up to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. And God says that those that consult with familiar spirits or wizard or enchanters or th those that practice necromancy and a whole list of things, he said that those things are an abomination to God. And those scriptures jumped out at me from the Bible and they jumped off the pages and they actually went right through my spirit. And I was convicted of sin for the first time in my life. It seemed to Yasmin that everywhere she went, she met Christians. I would ask him questions like, how does this Jesus come inside of you? I, I mean, what does it mean that you mean a man, another man comes inside of you? What does this born again mean? What does save mean? So I would ask questions, and even though I didn't understand them, I would still learn. At home, her boyfriend became violent. Yasmin was also having vivid nightmares that kept her up at night. During this time, another Christian friend gave her a message. She said that the man that I was living with was going to kill me if I didn't leave, and that the Spirit of the Lord told her that I must leave him immediately. When she spoke to me, I just started crying. It broke something in me, and I, had, and I knew it was God, even though I didn't know God. So I, um, I packed all my bags, and I told my mom that I was moving to North Carolina. She moved in with her brother, who invited her to church. I walked into that church, and when the worship started, I began to weep and weep and weep uncontrollably during worship and singing songs. And I had no idea what was happening to me. And I felt how much God loved me and he didn't hate me for all the things that I was doing in my past and all the abominations that I was practicing and how much he wanted to reach out to me and be a father to me. After going to church for a while, she made a decision. And I looked up into heaven and I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe what people have said about you, that you're the son of God, that you died on the cross for me and you died for my sins. I said, please forgive me and come inside of me and live in me and be the Lord and Savior of my life. The change was almost instantaneous. The next morning, all my bad dreams were gone. My torment was gone. Everything was gone. It was like 
a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, the weight of sin, the weight of deception, and I felt like I was alive for the first time in my life. I had a big bonfire, and I burned everything that I had, even the music, the books that I had, um, the objects that I had all over my walls, the pictures, the clothes, the jewelry. I had to break everything in my life and break those chains over my life. Yasmin's life was on a new path. It was really a pretty awesome walk with the Lord. Um, I was thankful to the Lord for just opening my eyes so I could see. Instead of teaching people about the New Age, the Lord had me um, telling people how dangerous the New Age is. She always loved to sing, and as she developed her voice, she knew it was a gift from God. Come to Jesus, come home. I love music because music is such a way that God speaks to our spirit, and God says that He inhabits the praises of His people. I see so many people, whether it's in the church or out of the church, that are so lonely and they're hurting and they're desperate. Jesus is the only one that can fill that void. The Lord really spared me from death, not just spiritual death, but physical death and emotional death. I could have lost my mind. I could have been internally separated from God. So I thank God for his mercy and his love that he loved me when I had nothing to offer him. As a child, I remember thinking there's just something not right, but then again, at the same time, what, what could be wrong? We're, my parents are taking me to these ceremonies, and you know, what could be wrong with what we're doing? When she was a little girl, Linda Correa spent her Sunday mornings attending Catholic Mass. But under the cover of night, she and her family followed a darker religion called Santeria. It's a cult-like practice that merges Catholicism with voodoo-type ceremonies and saint worship. My parents took us to these uh, ceremonies, these prayer meetings, these seances. Linda says the rituals were frightening. I saw manifestations. I, I, I saw people possessed. People that are, are not normally bad, they became like these horrible people after the spirits um, took over their body. Linda and her brothers also feared their godmother and the influence she held over their parents. I would just compare her to like a cult leader because it seemed like she had some control over my parents that I can't understand. Um, she used to be very verbally abusive uh, to us and sometimes she got physically abusive and my parents didn't really do anything about it. When her brother Isaac was a teen, he took a stand against their godmother. During this ceremony, a spirit went into a lady and she became very flirtatious. She was cursing, she was very sexual. She was almost like a prostitute. And my brother, he questioned, you know, if this is a good religion, if this is a good thing, why is she acting like a prostitute? Why is she cursing like that? I guess my godmother noticed that he was, you know, questioning Santeria and what she did was actually turn us against him. Around this same time, Isaac made a new friend. He started going to church with him and reading his Bible. My brother just kept coming home and questioning, you know, what he had learned from the church and the Bible. He kept coming home and he kept saying, you know what you're doing is wrong. The Bible says you're not supposed to be worshiping idols. We were angry at him because nobody likes to be questioned about their religion he kind of started opening up our eyes. One night, Isaac came home and smashed all the family statues. I found my mom crying because my brother was like in a fury. He smashed all the idols and my mom was devastated. After the statues were destroyed, Linda felt a shift in her family. It was like a curse was lifted. Little by little, we stopped going it's ironic how my parents would go to these ceremonies to obtain luck and good fortune, and we had the opposite. We were living in hell. Linda's family broke away from her godmother and from Santeria, but it was a few years before she was truly free. At age 20, Linda was going through a painful divorce. I got married, and it only lasted about five months, and I was devastated and 
it was that point in time when I was hurting the most that um, I turned to God. I remember giving my life to Christ and from then on my whole life changed. He gave me strength and he changed me. I became a new woman. Over the next few years, her relationship with God continued to grow. I consider Jesus my friend. I had a hunger for God. I, I wanted to know as everything about him. And it was the first time in my life that I read the Bible in its entirety. I had never done that before. And I just started gaining wisdom. And I, I wanted to just learn all about this wonderful God that delivered us from this horrible I, I call it like a, a horrible evil cult. Today she has something that Santeria could never give her. I have peace. I have peace. I have joy. I'm not going to say I don't have any problems. I have problems, but I won't turn to Santeria to resolve my problems. I will turn to the Bible. I will turn to my Jesus. Pictures would fall off the walls. Cabinet doors in the kitchen would open. Um, the doorbell would ring, and there would, no, no one would be there. Isela grew up in a family plagued by paranormal experiences and fear in their home. In search for answers, her mother embraced the occult. She believed that um, someone had placed a spell on the family because of all the bad experiences that um, she had and we all had. As a teenager, Isela followed her mother's lead into the occult. I wanted to seek answers um, and I needed guidance of some sort. And I thought, you know, if my mom seeked guidance through tarot card readings and um, palm readers, I figured, hey, this is the way to go. This is the way to get answers. She never found the answer she was looking for. Her young life remained trapped and hopeless. I wanted to end my life. Um, I thought, what, what am I living for? What do I have to live for? I was lost and I turned to drugs, alcohol, started heavily drinking. Sometimes I would walk all night because I had nowhere to sleep. She learned to read tarot cards and began practicing witchcraft in an effort to gain control of her life. But for Isela, there was no escape from the fear and darkness that defined her life. I knew that the devil was with, was with me this whole time. Like, I felt him. I felt a, a negative presence because I wanted the negative presence, as weird as it sounds. I thrived on the, the negative. I thrived on the dark. I thrived to feel the darkness because I was so consumed and I was in such a bad place that that was all I knew. Eventually, she got off drugs and had a child. She moved in with her boyfriend, whom she would later marry. But the spiritual darkness followed her and became evident even to her young daughter. She just randomly out of nowhere started pointing from where she was sitting and she was saying monster. The monster close to me, the monster touched my feet. And she was just trying to like move away from whatever she was looking at. And I thought, oh my goodness, I what is this? I was just anxious and I couldn't sleep at night. When I would wake up in the morning, I would look around and I always felt that there was something there. The encounters with demonic spirits multiplied and became more intense around Isela and her daughter. She had handprints on her body. Then it escalated to bite marks. I was beyond myself because how do I protect my daughter? Like, what do I do? I didn't believe in God at that time. Um, so I didn't, my, my husband would tell me, you know, you need to pray. And I would say, that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. Like, what, is, what does that even do? Desperate, with no other options, Isela asked her aunt, who was a pastor, for prayer. She prayed with all of us in the house. And uh, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace. And I told my husband, I felt incredible, like a very peaceful feeling. And he said, that was the Holy Spirit. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> but okay, whatever that means, I'll take it. I, I love that feeling. But as they prayed, a candle exploded in another room. 
something had caused that. Something didn't like the prayer. Something didn't like the good things that were going on in that house. Isela then reached out to her uncle, who was also a pastor, for help. My uncle asked me, do you accept God in your life? You know, I thought about it and I, I said, you know, I will do whatever it takes to help my daughter. He led her in a prayer for repentance and forgiveness. I repeated the words that my uncle was saying. Again, I felt that overwhelming sense of peace. And I knew after I said that prayer that my life was gonna change. I knew, I didn't know how because I didn't understand the concept yet. I just knew this is something big. Things began to change right away. In the following weeks, she says God filled her with the Holy Spirit and gave her incredible joy. At that moment, I knew that this was something that was happening and it was supernatural. And to hear that it was a gift from God, I thought, he, he loves me that much. He loves me that much to give me, a, to let me have this gift. Like, why do I deserve this? Like after everything that I've been through and experienced and all of the bad things I had ever done, all of a sudden I have God showing up in my life and saying, hello, I love you. You know, it's, it's just an amazing feeling. It's, it's an overwhelming feeling of love and peace and joy and just everything that's good. You know, it, it comes from Him. Since the day she invited Jesus into her life, the demonic darkness that wants to find her has been replaced by the light and presence of God. I feel new, completely new. And to me, that's just amazing because I never thought I could, I could be different. I was in the dark for so long and just to have that light upon me is just the most gratifying and the most amazing and beautiful feeling in the world. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. I will never go back, ever. At 28 years old, Mara Lanz was a wife, a mother, and an account executive at a radio station in Tampa, Florida. She was also a medium for those seeking insight from the spirits. Well, different people that I met, I would see these spirits and they look like, like people, but they're transparent. And they would talk to me and tell me about the person and about their home life. Mara first heard spirits speaking to her at 13 while using a Ouija board with friends. But she believes it started before she was even born. In Cuba, my grandmother was a very renowned spiritist medium. When my mother was pregnant with me, she prayed over my mother's stomach. We would pray to the different saints. At 15, the lady that was babysitting me, she was involved in the occult. The lady my mom took me at 18 was involved in Santeria. I'm saying, okay, this is the way it is. I guess if you believe in God, this is what believing in God is. As she delved deeper into spiritism, she was convinced her gift was from God. I thought I was working for Jesus, and I thought I was helping people. Even the altar she built when she was an adult had Catholic symbols. It was um, like a triangle. I had a brandy sifter with water, a crucifix, and then the Bible opened to Psalms 23. I had cauldrons. Animal sacrifices were in there, and I felt a power, but it wasn't a good power. It felt like something else was in control. It wasn't me. Although Mara looked to the spirits for wisdom and direction, her life was in chaos and confusion. By her late 20s, she had divorced, remarried, and was without hope. I was very fearful. I was angry. My husband and I were fighting all the time. I always felt like there was an emptiness, a hole, something missing in my life. I even had thoughts of driving my car into a telephone pole and committing suicide. I'm like, I don't, I'm not happy. There's gotta be something better than this. One day, Mara was filling in for the receptionist at the radio station when an old classmate walked in. He was now a pastor and was there to record a weekly program. He asked Mara if he could pray for her. At first, she gave it little thought. And I said, sure, you can pray for me all you want. And I'm, and I'm just smoking my cigarette. And then the following week, he would come and, and pray for me. 
I started doubting what I was involved in. Something was changing. And I said, Jesus, if what I'm involved in is of you, show me. A few days later, Mara was with her family and the conversation turned towards the Bible. And I said, I can, you know, I, I can read anything out of the Bible. I can read a Psalm, I can read any little verse, but I can never read anything out of the book of Revelations. And my uncle looked me dead in the eye and he said, that's because you're with the devil. And he said, you can't be with God and the devil at the same time. And I got angry. Mara went home determined to read through Revelation. I grabbed the Bible off the altar. I was gonna start to read. The wall behind me started banging like ba 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 ba. And I got scared and I started to close up the Bible. But all of a sudden, it's like this presence entered this room, like the, a blanket of peace. The noise stopped instantly. That night, she read the entire book of Revelation. When I read the last word, which was amen, literally something flew off my eyes. I had this knowledge, this knowing that Satan had used me and he had deceived me all of my life. And I balled up my fist and I said, I renounce you, Satan, and all your works. The Lord said, now you're gonna work for me. The love that flooded my being was incredible. That missing hole was gone. The next day, she called the pastor that had prayed for her. Together, they tore down the altar in her home. The Holy Spirit just came in in such an awesome way that I asked him to take that vision away. So I didn't see spirits anymore. I asked the Lord and he did, he took it away. As Mara read the Bible, prayed and attended church, she learned to give God control of her life and her husband took notice. He saw such a change in me that it made him curious. So he started to go to church with me. He got saved eight months later. Today, Mara says she's found peace as she looks to God for guidance. I let Jesus take control of my life. Jesus took my fear. He set me free totally. It was his love that brought me to salvation. His love is everything to me. She was someone who I trusted, someone who I became comfortable being around. She spoke to me and she said, Alicia, I wanna tell you something. And she said, I'm involved in the occult. Alicia Sweeting Miller was 13 years old when she met Lorona, a school teacher who told Alicia she had psychic powers. And she said that I seen the gift in you I've seen the gift in you, and that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to you. I was attracted to you, and so I believe that I could help advance this gift. At the time, Alicia was living in Jamaica, where her parents raised her in church. In fact, just months before, she had given her life to Christ. It was really genuine. I was really excited because I knew for a fact that if I had died that time, I was in the right place or right standing. And I just began to spread the good news that I, have, I was now a Christian. I was now serving God. At first, Alicia was wary of Lorona, but there was also something intriguing about her new friend. I began to think that, okay, if she was a witch or if she practiced this thing, maybe she was a good person, maybe she was a good witch. I began to think about all the shows that I would have seen on television. I began to more deny, be in denial as to what she really was. Little by little, she introduced Alicia into the occult, using tarot cards, meeting spirit guides, and summoning spirits. There was one evening I decided I was gonna summon the demon. Suddenly I felt a jerk. And the only thing I remembered after that was walking down the streets in the traffic. A couple of neighbors were there. They were saying all sorts of stuff like, maybe it was drugs and she was on drugs and this thing was driving her out of her mind. As she delved more into the occult, Alicia enjoyed the sense of control she felt it gave her. I wanted to have that recognition. I wanted to be known about becoming one of the world's powerful witch. And I wanted to do what I wanted to do and no one telling me what to do. Alicia moved to the Bahamas to delve deeper into occult practices. She also became an angry and vengeful woman, ready to cast a spell on anyone who crossed her. At the time, I always believed that no one would do me anything and get away with it. I would have to get you back. And it would have to be worse than what you did to me. You know, I had this vengeance in me and I felt as if though I had to be my own God. By her early 20s, Alicia was a well-known witch, making great money reading fortunes for conventioneers. Then, one evening, Alicia had a visitor. I was coming from Paradise Island 
At that night, I did one of the biggest reading of my entire life. I think I read for almost 1,500 persons. And as I was driving over the bridge, it felt as if there was someone else was in the car with me, and I began to look over my shoulders, look in the mirror to make sure that no one else was in the car, and I began to think to myself, wonder if I picked up a spirit that was over there. That night when I got home, I felt as if though I was dumb. I felt like I couldn't talk. And I laid in the bed that night and I could not sleep. But I felt like I could not get up out of the bed to open the door and I could not open my mouth to say, hey, I'm in here. Alicia began to feel pressure on her chest that felt like a heart attack. I began to think to myself, I'm gonna die. Only in the movies, when I watch the movies that someone is gonna die, that their entire life begin to flash across their face just like this. And so I begin to say, if I die, I don't want to die like this. For the first time since she was 13, Alicia prayed to God. And I said, you know, God, if you spare me, if you give me one more chance, I would serve you. I want to change my life. I want to turn things around. I, I promise you that I would serve you for the rest of my life and I will tell others about you and about what you did for me. The presence left. Afterwards, Alicia called Lorona to tell her she was through and started reading her Bible and praying daily. One Sunday, she went to church. Uh, the, the message was that Sunday morning was um, starting over again. And as the pastor began to preach that Sunday, I began to cry. And it felt as though I couldn't stop crying. And I cried the entire service. And everything was just coming to me. The things that I did, the persons who I may have hurt, maybe physically, maybe mentally, maybe persons who I've shut out of my life, persons who I've hurt, hurt by my words. When Alicia got home, Lorona was waiting for her. She began to say that, you know, what are you doing? You know, these, you know, Christians have you brainwashed. What are you thinking? What are you doing? And then I got so bold and I said, you know what? Get out of my house. I don't want to see you in my house anymore. And I took out the cards, the rune cards, the tarot cards, the angel cards, all the cards that I had. I just began to take them out one by one and I began to drop them in the fire and I lit them a fire right there. And when the fire was over, I just fall to my knees and I began to cry out to God. I said, God, this is it. There's no turning back now. You know, I made up in my mind that 100% I'm going all the way. It ends tonight, you know, it's all gone. There's nothing else that I have in my house that represented the occult. There's nothing that I had in my house that re represented the kingdom of darkness. I started to surround myself with persons who were more, you know, into God and persons who were Christians. And they begin to counsel me to do deliverance sessions with me. And it caused me to grow spiritually. Alicia was recently married and became an ordained minister. She continues to grow in her faith and loves to share her story with others to help them avoid the snare of the occult. God saved me for a reason. Now I'm bold in Christ. I speak boldly for the kingdom of God. You know, he's a God that delivers. He's a God that's set free. He's a forgiven God. He's a loving God. You know, many persons thought that there was no turning around for me. He could do it for you. He could turn it around. He could turn things around. There could be transformation in your life, just as how God has done it for me. He would be able to do it for you.